I hope you've enjoyed your uh, dinner tonight. Zbigniew Brzezinski is a professor of U.S. foreign policy at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, and most recently the co-author of America and the World, Conversations on the Future of American Foreign Policy. It's wonderful to be in this great city. I met a number of your most distinguished citizens last night at a delightful dinner, and I feel very much at home. What we are experiencing tonight, both in the United States and in the world at large, has a lot to do with some fundamental misjudgments that have been made by those in power in Washington in the course of the last several years. We have a foreign policy which has isolated the United States, which has turned many of our friends away from us. We have had a foreign policy which involved us in a war of our own choice, a war that was not necessary, a war that was justified demagogically and, sad to say, deceptively, a war that has cost us many lives, that has cost many lives in Iraq, and a war, it's worth noting particularly tonight, which has cost us a great deal financially. The costs of that war have been running at approximately $12 billion a month. That's close to 50, a week, excuse me, a week. That's close to 50 billion dollars. Over five years, we have spent more than a trillion dollars on this war. These are staggering costs, and it's worth reflecting on that fact, given the sums that are being bandied around right now regarding the so-called bailout or economic recovery. Compounding the problems of today, namely the conjunction between a foreign policy that's been self-damaging and an economic crisis, the outcome of which is uncertain, is a further aspect of the current reality which is cause for concern. Namely, that the existing leadership in the United States is approaching its term of office. It's going to be leaving shortly. And its standing and capacity to influence national policy is relatively low. We have seen a dramatic example of that today when despite the pleadings of the President of the United States, of the leader of the Republican Party, two-thirds of Republican congressmen in Congress voted against that which the President and the current leader of the Republican Party were advocating. The paradox is that two-thirds of the Democrats voted for presidential proposals, one-third opposed. And the outcome, of course, is a policy paralysis which is going to endure at least for a few days more, hopefully no more than that, but the costs are quite enormous nonetheless. Nonetheless, I think we still have to think about foreign policy as well. And we have to look ahead and try to see what can we anticipate and what needs to be done. And it is useful perhaps to begin by reflecting on what we have been recently told about what to anticipate in the foreseeable future. In a speech to the US public called the State of the Union Message, the President of the United States made a remarkable statement, a remarkable statement regarding the future. He said the following, and he was speaking of the war on terror. We are engaged in the defining ideological struggle of the 21st century. We are engaged in the defining ideological struggle of the 21st century. Now just think what a remarkably bold assertion this is. The defining ideological struggle of the 21st century. This is now 2008. We still have 92 more years to go in this century, but the president knows what the defining issue of the century will be. Go back 100 years. Would anyone in 1908 have said that the defining conflict of the 20th century 
will be the struggle against red and brown totalitarianisms? Probably no one. Would anyone in 1808, seven years before the very conservative Congress of Vienna that shaped the power realities of the 19th century, would have predicted the fact that the 19th century will be dominated by spreading nationalist passions from France to Germany, to Italy, to Poland, and so forth. In brief, it is rather daring for the president to make that assertion, and I will not challenge him by an alternative interpretation of the rest of the century. But I do think that it may be appropriate to look at the foreseeable future and to ask ourselves, what kind of a world will the next president of the United States be inheriting? What kind of a decade is he likely to be living in? What is in store for us over the next decade or two.